Um, my name is Fotinia Grafiotti. I'm very, very excited to be here today uh, in Athens to talk about startups. Um, I have never been exposed to the startup community in Athens before, and I'm thrilled to be here. So I'm going to talk right now about how I left Greece, went to Canada, um, started on research at the University of Toronto, and I'm going to talk to you about the story of how I transferred research into development and ended up building a company. And then in the afternoon, I'm going to walk you through the challenges that we faced at the company and our go-to-market strategy. So in 2006, um, I was finishing my undergrad here in Greece at the Technical University of Crete. And I decided that I wanted to do a master's. So I convinced my traditional Greek mother that it would be OK if I left for a couple of years to go to uh, Canada <coughs> and um, do a master's. And then I promised here that I would be back in two years. So I did that. And I went there. And I fell in love with research. I really, really liked what I saw there. And so I decided to stay on and do a PhD there as well. So when I went to the University of Toronto, um, I joined a group that's doing research in biometric authentication. So our lab was researching technologies like face recognition, iris recognition, fingerprint recognition. And when I spoke to my advisor at the university, I said, what should I do for, for my research? He said, well, we have all of this. Uh, pick one and start investigating. And so I looked at all of them, and that was 2006. These technologies were not in the market quite yet, the mass market. Uh, we didn't have uh, fingerprint scanners on iPhones at that time. But they were very established scientifically. So I wanted to do something different, something a bit, a bit more new, let's say. So I started looking around um, and at the university. So when you're a um, junior student, what you do to um, find a topic is that you go to your senior uh, lab members and you ask them what they think. Um, and so I did that. And pretty much to summarize what people told me at the time was, whatever it is that you do, make sure it's simple. It's something that you can solve uh, in the next four to five years so that you're able to graduate. You don't want to stay in grad school forever. OK. so. I started looking around for topics, and I found this paper uh, written by a cardiologist. So this was the American Cardiology um, Journal. And this paper, um, the doctor would say there that cardiologists have a problem today. And the problem is that the human electrocardiogram, our heartbeats, tend to look very different from one person to the next. And this was a problem for them because they would have to establish universal diagnostic standards in order for automation um, in medical diagnostics for that to work. So how can they uh, diagnose if I'm sick uh, relative to a healthy person if I generally look different than everybody else? So when I looked at that report, I thought, well, that's terrible news for them. But it was an interesting opportunity to explore the very same idea for biometric authentication. So the question that I immediately asked was, can we actually authenticate people using their heartbeats, just our electrocardiogram? It was a very interesting idea, because if we got to actually prove that that would work, this would be a way more secure biometric than our fingerprints. You leave your fingerprints anywhere you touch. Your facial picture can be captured by any surveillance camera. So it was a very interesting project. The problem with the project, of course, was that, number one, I could definitely spend four to five years trying to prove that every human being has a unique heartbeat. And at the end of that time, to prove that we don't have unique heartbeats. So I would have to go back, scratch my research, and start from the beginning and find something new in order to graduate. And the second problem here was that when I told my mother uh, what I was going to do for my research, she came back to me saying, and if you build technology that recognizes people from their heartbeat, 
who is ever going to hire you? <laughs> and I'm not sure why. Um, perhaps because I was young and stupid at the time. I thought that it was a great idea. If I'm to do research, I, I, I should enjoy it at least. It should be something fun. So I decided to do it. And so I started this project, ECG for Biometric Identification. Um, so the first thing that one needs to do in order to build that the heartbeat can be used for authentication is you have to collect this signal from as many different people as possible. So you have to build this big database of signals in order to look at them and design algorithms that will process and authenticate. So in order to do that, uh, back at the university, um, I had access to a lot of students. So I enticed them to come to my lab. Uh, I offered them free pizza and coffee, which really goes a very long way uh, in grad school. As long as the food is warm, people will come. And uh, the students would come in. Uh, they would sit down for a couple of minutes. We will record their electrocardiogram from their hands and we would give them the pizza, they would go away. Months later, they will come back, do the exact same thing. So we did that. We built a big database of signals, and then we started looking at the signals, and we realized that indeed, there were unique characteristics for every individual. That was really, really exciting. So when I started though, publishing my, my research, the scientific community started to ask me, so hold on a second, if, if that works, then what happens if we start exercising? What happens if somebody develops a medical condition? And I thought at that time, what the hell, I thought that I can graduate with that and somebody else can take on that part of the research, <laughs> but that was not gonna be the case, so I had to address that as well. So what I did now is I went back in the lab and I invited the students to come back in, uh, pizza, coffee, this time, I got them to exercise, and then I recorded their ECG right after exercise. So the students were skipping rope, they were jumping up and down, um, running around the, com the campus, up and down the stairs. And I must admit that this almost got me kicked out of the university, because this is Canada, and people are very orderly and polite. So, uh, you know, a bunch of sweaty grad students running around the campus was disrupting natural order. They didn't kick me out. I got to develop this new um, uh, database with stress electrocardiogram. And when we started to investigate the signals, we realized that what makes the ECG signal unique is the shape of the heartbeat. It's not the frequency. So when you actually start to exercise, your heartbeats will come faster, but the shape of your heartbeats will not change. When we started to benchmark the technology against traditional fingerprint recognition systems, we realized that we were operating at the exact same accuracy. So that was very exciting. And so for my very, very last experiment in school, I decided that I want to collect signals outside the lab. So instead of asking people to come in, I would give them wireless devices that they can wear under their clothes throughout their day and at the end of the day, I would look at their electrocardiogram. I wanted to see if there's anything different that happens during the day in the wild, in the real world. So I did that with a bunch of students. I gave them these wireless monitors in the beginning of the day, and they went out, um, they went to classes, they had lunch, they met their advisors, they had just a normal day. At the end of the day, they came back and they gave me the devices, and when I looked at the signals, um, I realized that there was something something wrong. So although we had spent at that point almost four years building the signals, building, sorry, the algorithms that will automatically recognize the signals, it would work in the lab, but it was not working in the real world. There was something different happening in the wild. So I went back to the students. I said, what did you do today? Was there something different? Have you guys done something different? Did you mess up with the device? They said, no, we didn't touch the device. We had a normal day. We actually forgot we were wearing it. And the signals didn't have noise either. So I wasn't sure what was happening. And we pretty much sat on that problem for, for months until one day it hit me that the one thing I can control 
in the lab and which I cannot control in the real world is how people feel. And it turns out that emotions affect the human electrocardiogram. So every time you're happy, your ECG signal will, will change slightly. And when you're sad, it will also change. And it will change in different ways. And it changes in a different way for every individual. So our systems wouldn't work in the real world just because people were changing emotional states. I had no idea that that would be um, a challenge with ECG biometrics. But when I was faced with that, I was so amazed. I mean, I thought, imagine we can now build a machine that recognizes human emotion just from your electrocardiogram, using just that information. So I thought, forget about everything I've done so far. I will focus on building that one machine that recognizes human emotion. And I ran to my advisor's office and I told him my idea of uh, changing my PhD topic and he gave me a look like this. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, he said, absolutely no. Fotini, um, you will have to stick to, to what we did. You'll never graduate if you do this. So I parked this at the back of my head and I'm very excited that I'm actually doing this research today. We're building this emotion detection machine. But I'll continue on that, what happened after that. So I'm glad um, that he, he didn't let me change my topic because um, we ended up publishing quite a lot um, and because this is part of the normal scientific process in academia, that's what you would have to do. Um, with our publications, we attracted a lot of industrial interest. Uh, there were companies around the world that came to the University of Toronto and started to inquire about the status of the technology, whether it has been tested in the real world, can it be used? Um, and they came from very, very different industries. We had uh, military uh, customers, we had uh, opportunities in, the, um, in medical devices, consumer electronics, very, very diverse uh, interests. And so at that time, um, I, was, I was finishing my PhD. Um, it, was a, it was time. Uh, I also knew that I, I didn't want to stay in academia. I had grown sick of academia at that time. And uh, I also knew that I, I just couldn't see myself working for a, a Google or a Microsoft. So I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And when, when the university told me, you know what, you have, um, we, we can help you patent this technology and you can now, um, you can license it if you want, um, get a check and walk away or uh, you could build your own company and start to commercialize this yourself. And I thought, uh, I don't know what, how to build a company. I, I, don't, I don't know what a startup, I actually didn't know what a startup was at that time. I had no idea. Um, but I thought I'd give it a try because it was, it was my baby. I, I gave birth to that idea. I took it all the way to making it work in the real world. And now I wanted to actually put it in people's hands. I wanted to, to show the world what that was. And that's what I did. Um, I'm going to walk you through the details of um, the go-to-market for um, this technology in the afternoon. Um, we made a lot of mistakes. I will share all of them with you. Uh, but we built a product called the NIMI wristband in the end. And the NIMI is a wearable device um, that you, you put on your wrist in the beginning of the day. You uh, touch it with the opposite hand and it authenticates you using your heartbeat. And now you're wearing a device that knows who is wearing it. It's your identity. It's Bluetooth enabled, so you can um, unlock your uh, door at home. You can unlock your computer, bypass passwords. You can also uh, use it for payments. We, uh, I'm going to show to you the, the video that we put up for this product.
the NIMI is sold internationally today. Um, it was launched in 2013. Um, if you live in Canada, uh, but very soon uh, in Europe as well, uh, and you have a MasterCard, you can now um, pay with your NIMI instead of uh, using your MasterCard. Um, it's done pretty well. Uh, we uh, closed the seed round of 1.4 million and a Series A of 14 million. Um, most importantly, we launched a developer platform. Uh, we invited developers around the world to build applications for the NIMI. We created an SDK to control it. We signed up 6,000 people. And we like to joke in Canada because um, BlackBerry in Toronto has 2,000 developers. Uh, we had 6,000 developers. So we're pretty excited about that. So in the afternoon, um, I'm going to walk you through um, the process of getting to the NIMI. When you look at it today, you will say, of course, it makes sense. It's an interesting product. But it wasn't clear how we got there. We made a lot of mistakes, and I'll share all of those with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.